And I'm going to start off by honing in on verses 11, 12, and 13, because they offer a good summary of chapter 2. But they also offer a good summary of the book of Judges. So I'll also briefly look at some aspects elsewhere in Judges. When the Queen died last year, she was our longest reigning monarch. She'd served for over 70 years. And during that time, she had garnered a number of loyal servants around her. For example, Angela Kelly served as the Queen's personal assistant for over 25 years. And during that time, she was by the Queen's side, overseeing her needs and also looking after her appearance. Paul Wybride, meanwhile, served for over 40 years as the Queen's Sergeant in Arms, and he was responsible for serving the Queen's food, for managing her everyday affairs, and for also looking after her beloved corgis. But both these two were so loyal that they, they were so loyal that they gained access to the Queen's private quarters. So during lockdown, they watched TV with the Queen to keep her company. And Angela Kelly was also asked to wash the Queen's hair on a regular basis. They demonstrated their loyalty through their obedience and their actions. But it wasn't just these two individuals, for there are many more in our country who've demonstrated loyalty to the Queen. They have sworn an oath of allegiance, or they've made an affirmation. And these include our MPs, Prime Ministers, Chancellors, those who are magistrates, judges, those who serve in the police or the armed forces. But if one of these individuals hadn't made that oath or swore an affirm or made that affirmation, then there would have been serious consequences. For example, an MP wouldn't be allowed to carry out their everyday tasks and their seats in the Houses of Parliament would be declared vacant as if they had died. But it's not just in this country. There are others around the world who have demonstrated their loyalty to the Queen by swearing an oath or making an affirmation. For the Queen was the head of state in countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand. And these people thus benefited from their royal connections and privileges. But it's not just in the royal family. There are also other people from other countries that have lost their sovereignty. So if you go back from the 1900s, countries like <coughs> Prussia, East Germany, West Germany, Yugoslavia and the USSR no longer exist. And if you go back further in time, there are also, oh, the Roman Empire no longer exists and the British Empire no longer exists. And if we go back to the Queen, we can also see that some countries turn their back on the Queen. So countries like Pakistan, Nigeria and South Africa, they turn their backs on the Queen and they've lost their royal privileges as a result. And these are all interesting facts that we can draw upon as we look at our key verse this morning. Judges 2, verses 11 to 13. The Israelites did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them up out of Egypt. They followed the various gods of the people around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they had served Baal and the Ashtoreths. Three verses of scripture that need quite a bit of unpacking if we're going to understand them better this morning. For example, you may ask me, who are the Baals and who are the Ashtoreths? Well, Baal was a Canaanite god of fertility and rain. And if you wanted to worship Baal, you would have to be fairly committed. For you would have to clamber up to one of the high places around you. Then you would have to search out an altar, often accompanied by a sacred tree. And then to worship Baal, you would have to undertake acts of prostitution or child sacrifice. And the Ashtoreths were goddesses of war and fertility, and they too needed appeasing. But then you may say to me, who, why are the Israelites mentioned in this verse as they are throughout the Old Testament? Well, many historians will tell you the people of Israel have been around for over 4,000 years. And during that time, many nations have come and gone, like we've already discussed this morning, but yet the people of Israel still remain, which is remarkable when you think about the various persecutions they've endured during their history. And today, this tiny nation in the world plays a major role in world affairs. But why should this be so? Well, I believe we can get some answers when we look at Scripture. 
For example, if you read Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, it says this. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. And today we call that the promised land. I will make you into a great nation, and today we call that Israel. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And here God establishes a covenant with Abram, a covenant that promises him land in verse 1, divine blessings and favour in verses 2 to 3, and a unique role in the world of bringing blessing to other nations in verse 3. And elsewhere in Scripture, we find that God says to Abraham, your descendants will be vast in number and that they will occupy a great land forever. Genesis 13, verses 14 to 17. And the term forever here implies that the people of Israel will remain on the earth for the fullness of time. And this important fact didn't elude the chaplain to King Frederick the Great of Prussia in the 18th century. For when the king said to the chaplain, give me evidence that God exists, the chaplain replied, consider how the Jews remain in the world today. And perhaps Hitler should have taken heed of that advice, as verse 3 on our screen as well, before he tried to kill all the Jews in the Second World War. You see, God's word is trustworthy. It's true. So what about you? Do you trust God's word enough to be reading it daily, to apply his principles and teachings into your life and to allow it to transform your life? But let's return to Exodus, the people of uh, Israel. In Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6, we are told that the people were to be a treasured possession. They were to be a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Or in other words, they were to represent God to the people and the people to God. But we've just read, haven't we? The people didn't do that. They started worshipping the foreign gods around them. But then you may ask me, what is a covenant? Well, a covenant, I believe, is a special type of relationship between two or more parties that involves mutual obligations for all the parties concerned. So a covenant relationship is one that is committed to action and responsibility. So let me give you some examples. On the passage we just read in Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, leave your country, your country people, and your father's household, and I will make you into a great nation. Mutual obligations are placed on God and Abraham in order to develop a special kind of relationship. But today, people still make types of covenant when they get married, or they say wedding vows. It places mutual obligations on both parties to fulfill the institute of marriage so that they can develop a special kind of relationship. But the good news is that you too can enter into a covenant with God. For if you read Hebrews 9, verses 14 to 15, he says that if you give your life to God, he in return will forgive your sins. It's a covenant because he places obligations on us and obligations on God to develop a special kind of relationship. But then you may say to me, well, what's the book of Judges all about? Well, the book of Judges has nothing to do with legal judges as we know them today. But it tells the story of 11 men and one woman who were raised up and empowered by God to deliver the people of Israel from their oppressors. Judges 2, verse 16 tells us this. And six major judges are listed, so-called because they helped deliver the people of Israel from six major oppressions in their history. And these include Othniel, Ahab, Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson. And the other six judges are minor judges. And they're classed as Shamgar, Tola, Jer, Ibsam, Elon, and Abdon. Now, the book of Judges covers the period from 1390 BC, when their leader Joshua had died, all the way through to 1024 BC, when their king, their first king Saul, was placed on the throne. Now, Joshua had been Moses' assistant, and following Moses' death, Joshua was then asked to lead the people. And he subsequently led them into the promised land, thus fulfilling God's promise in Deuteronomy 31, 23. And Joshua's success was based very much on his willingness to be fully obedient to God, something Moses had failed to do in Numbers 20, verse 12. And under Joshua's leadership, 
the people remain completely obedient to God. And when Joshua enters the promised land, he finds many of the covenants that had been made to his ancestors were also fulfilled. Thus, the people enjoyed a period of peace. Joshua 1, 21 to 43. But if we go back a whole generation before that, as the people were preparing to enter the promised land, God gives the people of Israel a special task. And in Numbers 33, 51 onwards, we read, you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land. You shall destroy all their carved images and their cast idols. You shall demolish all their high places. You shall take possession of the land and settle in it. For I am giving you the land to possess. Well, God wanted to rid the land of all this wrongdoing. Why? Because he wanted nothing to get in the way of his relationship with the people of Israel. But this task came with a warning. Because in verse 55, he says, if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain there will become like barbs in your eyes and thorns in your side. They will give you trouble in the land wherever you live. And unfortunately for the people of Israel, this promise was soon to become true. Now, the problems began for the people of Israel following Moses' death because there was no appointed leader to lead the people in the ways of God. So the people subsequently abandoned God's instructions to rid the land of sin. And Judges 1, verses 11 to 2, verses 5, tell us this. And consequently, the people of Israel became captivated by the world around them, by those traditions, practices, and beliefs. So much so, they started to marry into these communities, and then they started to worship these foreign gods. And Judges 2, verses 6 to 3, verses 7, tells us more. You see, the people of Israel abandoned the one true God. The God who'd led them out of Egypt, across the wilderness, and into the promised land. And they were now living lives how they wanted to. Now, can you imagine Angela Kelly or Paul Wybrow going to the Queen and saying, Sorry, Mom, we're not going to live lives now how we want to do. We're not going to do what you want to do. You just can't. So my question to you this morning is this. How are you living your lives? Are your eyes fixed upon the world around you or are they fixed upon Jesus? Perhaps you're somebody now who is living how they used to live because we no longer have a leader or a church minister to teach us in the ways of God. Or perhaps you're somebody who has succumbed to the pattern of this world rather than the pattern of teaching to be found in Scripture. Maybe you're someone like the people of Israel who is living lives how they want to, and you no longer meet with your brothers and sisters in Christ during the week who can encourage you. Or perhaps you're like the people of Israel in that you no longer have put aside the temptations in your life and you've succumbed to them and they're affecting your relationship with God just like those foreign gods with the people of Israel did. Or in other words, is God sovereign in every aspect of your life? The Israelites were unwilling to deal with the wrongdoing in the land before them. And that whole generation before, they sent spies into the land. And those spies had come back and said, oh, the people there are like giants. We can't go into the land. They're big and mighty. We're not going to go in there. And perhaps you today have issues in your life that are like giants. Perhaps there are issues in your life that are strong and mighty that are affecting your relationship with God. Maybe you've got an addiction that you're struggling to overcome. Or maybe you've been attracted to the pleasures of the world that seem harmless, but you now realize those pleasures are taking you away from God. If this is you, then come to God this morning in prayer. You see, the Israelites' unwillingness to obey God and follow God's commandments show that they were undermining God's sovereignty. They were failing to demonstrate their loyalty and obedience to God through their actions. And in many ways, they were following the example of those countries who turned their backs on the queen. They were demonstrating lives like Paul and Angela, who demonstrated the sovereignty of God in their lives. So what about you? Are you demonstrating the sovereignty of God in your lives? Are you reading your scriptures, applying his teachings into your life, having your life changed? And when people ask you, why are these changes happening? You give glory to God. 
God had to respond to the disobedience of the Israelites. He allowed the people to become oppressed. But why, you may say, did he allow this? Well, God needed to punish them. Why? Because he needed to bring the people to their senses. But this immediately starts a change of events that go on and on and on. The people cry out to God in their distress. God hears them. He raises up a judge who teaches them in the ways of God and delivers them from their oppressors, only for the people then to turn their backs on God once more. But we learn something important about God here. We learn that God is a God of grace and a God of mercy. But what does grace and mercy mean? Grace means where God gives us things we don't deserve. And mercy means where God doesn't give us things we do deserve, such as our punishments. And if you examine your lives, you'll see that God has been gracious to you and merciful to you at times in your life. But one thing stands clear from all this, despite these characteristics. Sin has consequences. It leads to suffering. So what about you? Are you somebody who only calls on God during the bad times like the people of Israel? Or do you acknowledge God in all your ways? Is your faithfulness to God consistent? Or is it like the Israelites and it depends on who you're with or the environment that you find yourselves in? Or maybe deep down you know that you have been taking advantage of God's grace and mercy. That you know you're living the life that God doesn't want you to live. So if this is you this morning, why not come to God and repent? The book of Judges was written in Hebrew originally. And the Hebrew word for repent is shub. S-H-U-B. And it means to turn or to go back and was often used to describe the relationship of the people of Israel with God because the people either turned towards God or they turned back from God. But when they turned towards God, it was often when they repented. For repentance means to completely change direction in your lives, to change your attitudes, your approach and your belief towards God, to allow Amen. God to reign sovereignly in your life. Come to God this morning and repent if you need to. But let's move on and briefly consider three of the judges we find in the book of Judges. And Judges chapter 3 contains three of these judges. There's Othniel in verse 7 to 11, Ahod in verses 12 to 30, and Shamgar in verse 31. Bible scholars will tell you that names in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, often reflected somebody's characteristics in their life. The scholars tell us that Othniel means strength of God, force of God, or lion of God. So did Othniel live up to his name? Well, if we read Judges 3, verses 8 to 10, it tells us that Othniel defeated Cushan Rishahim, the king of Aram Naharim, which is a bit of a mouthful. He subjected the people of Israel to eight years of oppression. Now, in Hebrew, Cushan Rishahim means Cushan of double wickedness. And here we get a picture of the type of oppression the people of Israel were under. And if you turn to Judges 1 verses 11 to 13, we also find out that Othniel was a very strong man in his own might because he already had defeated or had one military victory under his belt before he defeated this king. So you could argue that he'd done things in his own strength. But in verse 10 of Judges 3, we read, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, and he overpowered King Aram. So despite his strength, Othniel allowed God to work in his life to achieve a miraculous victory, to release the people from their oppression and lead them into 40 years of peace. And during Othniel's reign, the people of Israel remained completely obedient to God. But when Othniel dies, the people once more turn their backs on God. And then they become subject to King Edlon of Moab. And then they cry out to God, and God raises up another judge. Now, many scholars suggest that our second judge wasn't a strong person, but that they were actually weak. But we don't get this evidence when we first read Scripture. Judges 3.15 says, Again the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer. Ahud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. But if we go back to the Hebrew that this verse was written in and we translate it word for word, we get a slightly different slant. 
For it then says, Ahab, the son of Gera, the son of the Benjamite, was a man with a right hand in the kingdom. It suggests that he had a weakness in one hand. We don't know what that weakness was. But Ahab takes a tribute to King Eglon, which was probably some crops grown in his land to appease the king. But on the way there, he straps his double-edged sword to his right thigh and conceals it. Now, the double-edged sword was a very long, old-fashioned sword with two sharp edges down either side that we could be used for thrusting into objects. But we don't know what happens next. But we do know he finds himself in front of the king. Maybe he's bypassed security because of his impeded hand. He was seen not to be a threat. Or maybe they searched his left thigh where people usually have their weapons. But he finds himself in the king's presence. And scripture tells us that this king was a very large, overweight person. Probably symbolic of the type of empire that he was overseeing. For they must have been consumed by greed, desires of the flesh and much indulgence. But scripture tells us this. That the king was so fat that when Ahab plunged his double-edged sword into the king's stomach, the sword was immediately swallowed up by the excess fat. And immediately I am reminded of a verse of scripture. Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing souls and spirits, joints and marrow. It judges thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And I believe today that if we turn to God's word and are obedient, it can equally work as effectively in our lives and just as quickly as Ahab's sword did within the king's stomach. So what did the people of Israel learn from this experience? I believe they learned their foreign gods were no good at releasing them from their oppressors. I also believe they learned that living in a land full of indulgence and greed was not going to bring them satisfaction, but only a true relationship with the one and true and living God could do that. Under the Hayud's obedience, the people enjoyed eight years of peace. But then we come to our final judge this morning, Shamgar. In Judges 3, verses 3 to Judges 3, verse 31, we're told, after Ehud came Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He, too, saved Israel. Now, historians will tell us that during this period, the Philistines had entered the Iron Age, and they controlled production of iron in that region. The scripture probably backs this up, too. For in 1 Samuel 13, verses 19 to 22, we're told the people of Israel had to go to the Philistines to have their agricultural tools sharpened. And we're also told that only Saul and Jonathan in that army had a sword or a spear, for all their weapons had been confiscated from them. And here we find Shamgar with an ox goad. Now, what on earth is an ox goad, you may ask? Well, it's an eight-foot pole. And on one end, it's got a metal end that you would prod the cattle with to get them to move along and journey where you wanted them to go. And on the other end, you would find a spade that was used for cleaning the plow. And probably this was the nearest thing that Shamgar had to a weapon if all the other weapons had been confiscated. But does Shamgar bemoan the fact and go to God and say, God, this is ridiculous. We have no weapons. I don't know what to do. You're not going to be able to use me. No, he doesn't. Shamgo goes to God and allows God to use him with what he has. And this shouldn't surprise us, because throughout the book of Judges, we find this happening again and again and again. And to give you some examples, Jael uses a hammer and a tent peg to kill a hill captain in Judges 4.21. Gideon routes a whole army with horns and torches in Judges 7 verse 20. And Samson kills a thousand with the jawbone of a donkey in Judges 15, verse 15. So today, if you feel you're lacking in talent, skills, or abilities, or that God can't use you in your life, then think again. Maybe you think you've turned away from God and your relationship isn't as it can be, and that God can't use you, then think again. Because God is looking for us to repent, to turn towards God, to live lives that are obedient through our actions, so that God can work in our lives and use us in a mighty way. So how do we conclude our message this morning? I believe that God is our Lord and King and he wants to reign supreme in our lives. And like Angela Kelly and Paul Wybrow who demonstrated the sovereignty of, God, of the Queen in their lives, 
we too need to demonstrate the sovereignty of God in our lives. But we need to do this whether the times we are experiencing are good or bad. And we can only do this through our actions and our obedience. You see, like the Israelites, when times are bad, we have nothing else to cling on to but God. But when times are God, we get deviated by the things in the world, the pleasures going on, and we begin to look at our own strengths. So we need to be reading our scriptures, examining our lives. Is there any part of our lives that don't belong to God? And if they don't, then we need to repent, change direction in our attitude and approach and belief to God, and allow God to work in our lives. And as we live out these lives of obedience, God will continue to work in our lives and will ask us to live out lives that are completely different to those in the world around us. Just like the people of Israel are asked to abandon the traditions, practices and behaviours of those communities around them. But when we do this, we need to be sure that we don't behave like the Israelites. We turn to God when the times were bad, but turned away from God when the times were good. We need to make sure that we constantly live lives that are obedient to our actions. Because when the people of Israel turned away from God, they fell into despair and anguish. You see, if we live lives that are obedient to God, then we too will begin to benefit from our royal connections and privileges, just like Paul and Angela did with the coin. So let's examine our lives this morning. Let's make sure God is reigning supreme in all our lives and just not a little bit of it. Let us pray now. Father, we just thank you that you are Lord of our lives. And we ask that you would become Lord of every part of our lives. As a people, help us to be obedient through our actions, Lord, but also help us to examine our lives and to come to you and repent where things don't belong to you so that you may reign supreme in every part of our lives. Help us to trust in you, to guide us, to lead us, and to show us how to live our lives, so that we can live lives that are holy and pleasing to you in all that we do. Amen.